Hello again, uh, grandchildren. For this day, we're going to read The Land of Stories, The Wishing Spell by Chris Colfer, and it's chapter nine, called The Charming Kingdom. Alex and Connor woke up on the floor of Rapunzel's tower just after sunrise. They were snuggled under the blankets Froggy had given them, and they'd used their p bags as pillows. How did you sleep? Alex asked her brother. Like I slept on the floor of a tower, Connor said, thinking he'd never take his bed at home for granted again. He stretched his back, and his joints made sounds like firecrackers. They put away their blankets and decided to get an early start on their day. Alex insisted on tidying up the tower, leaving it in better condition than they had found it in. I'd hate for anyone to think we made this mess, Alex said. Connor rolled it out, his eyes at her and made sure she saw it. What's our next stop? Connor asked, asked Alex. She looked back and forth from the map in one hand and the journal in the other. Well, the charming kingdom is just east of here, Alex said. I figure it would be easiest to go there and see if we can get hold of Cinderella's slipper. And how exactly are we going to do that? Connor asked. Alex had to think about it. We'll just ask if we can borrow it, she decided. Fat chance, Connor said. That's like walking into the White House and asking for the Declaration of Independence. Although Connor was wrong about the whereabouts of the Declaration of Independence, Alex knew he was right to be concerned. How are they going to get their hands on one of Cinderella's slippers? Surely they must be the most prized possession of the kingdom. We'll have to try our best, Alex said. What other option do we have? The twins traveled down the spiral staircase at the core of Rapunzel's tower and returned to the path. They eventually came to a fork where a new path splintered off in an eastern direction. The sign above the fork said, Charming Kingdom, and pointed in the direction the new path was headed. Connor, look at that sign, said Alex, pressing her hands against her cheeks. Now I really wish I had a camera. They traveled down the new path for quite a while without discovering anything new, but the same dirt path and evergreen trees they had seen for the last two days. Connor became more anxious the farther he walked, letting out large extended sighs every minute or so. Are you sure we aren't lost? I swear I've seen that boulder and that tree about 20 times already, he said, pointing. I'm positive we're traveling in the right direction. I've been watching the map since we left, Alex said. We should be approaching a stream very soon, and once we cross it, we'll be in Charming Kingdom. Connor sighed again. It would be his last one for a while, so he made sure it lasted extra long. A couple of hours later, there was no stream in sight. Connor was starting to lose faith in his sister's navigational abilities. This place must be bigger than we thought, Alex said, or this map is completely off scale. Eventually, the twins found the stream Alex had seen on the map. The path went across a small bridge made out of pale stones and then continued on the other side. You see, I told you I knew where I was going, Alex said with her head held high. Yeah, 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 Connor said. Honestly, Connor, I'm a little disappointed in your lack of faith, Alex gloated. If there's one place I should know my way around, it would have to be grrr. Connor heard his sister's high-pitched scream before he realized what had happened. A large troll had jumped right in front of them on the bridge. He was short and very wide, with an enormous head. He was covered in matted fur with large eyes and a snout. His arms and legs were tiny, but his nails and te teeth were sharp and long. You are on my bridge, the troll shouted. How dare you? Uh, we're, we're so sorry, Alex said, clutching onto her brother like a monkey to a tree. We had no idea this bridge belonged to anyone. Maybe you should put a sign on it or something, Connor suggested, and then regretted it once it made the troll even angrier. <clears throat> what are you doing on my bridge? The troll demanded. 
trying to cross into the charming kingdom, Alex said. We didn't mean any harm. No one crosses my bridge without answering a riddle, the troll said. A riddle? Alex asked, letting go of Connor. Oh, you're a bridge troll. A bridge troll? Connor asked. Yes, like in the three billy goats gruff, Alex said happily. She was so excited to be witnessing another fairy tale occurrence, all her fear faded away. If you are to cross my bridge, you must answer my riddle correctly, the bridge the bridge troll said, troll said. Answer incorrectly and I'll bite your head off. Excuse me? Bite off our heads, Connor said. Steam was practically coming from his ears. What is wrong with everyone in this place? Why does everyone we meet want to eat us? Can someone please explain to me why this keeps happening? Connor, calm down, Alex insisted. Let's just solve the riddle, and then we'll be on our way. What if we get the riddle wrong, Connor said. He'll kill us. Let's just find another way across the stream. Connor, don't be silly. If a simple billy goat can answer a riddle correctly, I'm sure we can too, Alex reassured him. Besides... There isn't another bridge for miles. Connor grunted and crossed his arms. How are we so sure this is actually his bridge? Connor said. I'd like to see some ownership identification before we continue. Alex ignored this. What's your riddle, Mr. Bridge Troll? She asked. May I call you Mr. Bridge Troll? The Bridge Troll eyed the twins and jauntily swayed from side to side as he began the riddle. What can be as small as a pea or as large as the sky and is not owned by the person who purchases it? Purchases it? Purchases it? It asked. The wheels in Alex's head began turning immediately. She loved riddles. That's a tricky one, Alex said. Pressed her index finger against her lips as she thought. Do you have any guesses, Connor? Nope, you're on your own, Connor said. You have one guess before I bite your head off, so guess wisely, the bridge troll said, doing a small dance and clapping his hands. That's it. I'm out of here, Connor said. He walked off the bridge and slowly made his way down the stream. Connor, what are you doing? Alex called out. I'm crossing the stream, Connor yelled back. No bridge is worth that much trouble. He slowly stepped into the stream and began traveling across it. The water was freezing, but his frustration kept him warm enough that it didn't matter. The water rose higher and higher as he traveled farther across it. It's not that deep, Alex, Connor said. The current isn't even that strong. He reached the middle of the stream, and at its deepest, the water came to just above his waist. You're cheating, said Alex, and then asked the bridge troll, Is that even allowed? Can he do that? He isn't the one who asked for the riddle. You are, said the bridge troll. Connor had crossed the stream by now and was soaking wet. Alex continued thinking about the riddle. So, it can be as small as a pea and as large as the sky. So basically you're telling me it can be any size. And the person who buys it doesn't own it. So that means someone else owns it, she thought out loud. Hurry up, Alex, Connor shouted. Oh, hush, Alex said. I'm going to say that it must be a gift. A gift can be any size, and the receiver is who owns it, not the person who purchases it. The bridge troll stopped swaying from side to side and slumped over. That's correct, the bridge troll said disappointedly. You may pass. Alex clapped her hands together and did a small jump. She extended her hand out to offer the troll a handshake but he ignored it. Instead, he crawled back below to wherever he had jumped out from. See, Alex said once she'd met up with her brother on the other side of the bridge. I knew I'd answered it correctly. Connor shook his head. And I'm sure I'll have to hear about it for the rest of our lives, he said. But let's try to make it to Cinderella's palace by sundown, okay? The twins continued their journey into the charming kingdom. They were excited to see different scenery as they traveled. The evergreen trees they had seen so much of became scarce and were slowly replaced by large oak trees. There were also vast fields of tall grass and wildflowers that grew everywhere they looked. 
It's so beautiful here, Alex said. They had been walking for hours and still saw no sign of anything. Connor was practically dry by now. Where is everything? Connor asked. The Charming Kingdom is a very big place, Alex said. It's going to take a while to get to the palace. It began to get dark and the twins became very worried. There was no shelter in sight. Soon the moon was their only source of light. They walked a short distance off the path and found a grassy area where a few trees they had assumed and hoped was safe, and they decided to spend the night there. Connor tried making a fire by rubbing two sticks together, but was unsuccessful. Now I really wish I had signed up for Boy, Spout, Boy Scouts, he said. It was their first night sleeping outside. Both kept waking up every hour or so to make sure they were still safe, because every sound terrified them. What was that? Alex gasped in the middle of the night. That's an owl, Connor said, or a very inquisitive dove, but either way, I think we're safe. The next morning, the sunrise woke them. They restlessly got to their feet and returned to the path. We're running out of food, Alex said, after eating one of their last apples. We'll have to stock up as soon as we find a market or something. I'm so tired of rolls and apples. I'm starting to think we should have asked Froggy to pack us some flies, Connor said. Gosh, I would kill for a cheeseburger. Maybe that's why everyone eats each other here. They just ha haven't discovered fast food yet. They found a small pond on the side of the path and splashed some water on their faces. We look so tired, said Alex, looking at their reflections in the water. The twins heard a galloping sound coming from behind them on the path. They turned to see a small cart of firewood being pulled by a gray horse. It was steered by a man with a big floppy green hat. Let's ask him how much farther until the palace Alex said and ran over to the cart. Excuse me, sir. Whoa, the man said, slowing his horse to a stop. May I help you? How much farther until we reach Cinderella's palace? Alex asked. Are you traveling by foot? The man asked. Unfortunately, Connor said. Then I'll, then it'll take you days to get there, the man said. Alex and Connor looked at each other completely exasperated. I'm delivering this firewood near the palace tonight the man said. I can give you a ride if you'd like. Before we could finish, he could finish his sentence, Connor had climbed up aboard the cart. Thank you so much, Alex said. This is so kind of you. The twins traveled with the man for the rest of the day. Connor made himself comfortable on top of the firewood and napped almost the entire trip, waking up every so often whenever they hit a bump in the road. Alex, on the other hand, took full advantage of having an actual human to talk to from the fairy tale world. What's your name? Alex asked the man. Smithers, the man said. Where are you from? She asked. I grew up in a small village in the northeastern part of the Charming Kingdom, Smithers said. What's it like here? Alex said dreamily. My brother and I, um, haven't been around this kingdom very much. The Charming Kingdom is a quiet place, Smithers said. It has many small villages on the outskirts of the kingdom and many wealthy estates in the center, near the palace. Have you ever been to the palace before? Alex asked. Oh, yes. I make many deliveries there during the year, he said. In fact, tonight the king and queen are having a huge ball. They are? Alex's eyes doubled in size. She sh shook Connor awake. Connor, did you hear that? Cinderella's having a ball tonight. Isn't that wonderful? What are the chances? What? Oh, er, that's great, Connor said, and then immediately fell back asleep. Why are they having a ball? Alex asked. Oh, uh, they haven't had... They've had one every month since their wedding, Smithers said. It's the celebration of their marriage. What's Queen Cinderella like? She asked. Absolutely beautiful and the best queen our kingdom has ever had, Smithers said with a big grin. Not too many people were eager to to accept her when she first moved into the palace, though. Many of the aristocratic families were upset that Prince Charming hadn't chosen one of their daughters to wed, but she's overcome all that sense. Alice could tell they were getting much closer to the palace. They passed more small villages, which grew in size and population as they went along. She was so excited to be so close to people, actual people, 
who had spent their entire lives in the fairy tale world. She wished with all her heart she could say she'd grown up in the charming kingdom. Do you ever find it overwhelming? She asked Smithers. Does it ever get frightening living here and knowing that at any moment a fairy could fly by and grant you a wish or an ogre could run up and eat you? Smithers looked at her curiously. Does such a place exist where people can't unexpectedly be helped or hurt? Alex couldn't think of any. Maybe this world and the world where she was from weren't so different after all. The cart began passing large estates. Everywhere they looked, they saw another huge, elegant home. They were all so bright and colorful with pointed roofs that curved on the sides. Some were made of wood, others from brick, and some were covered completely in ivy. It was something straight out of a storybook, and Alex kept reminding herself that she was in one. We're almost at the palace, Smithers said. The cart began to vibrate as the dirt path beneath them turned into a cobblestone street. Shops and markets started popping up on the sides of the street as they traveled into the city. They shared the road with other carts and carriages. Villagers and town people alike walked alongside them and went about their day-to-day -day routines of shopping and trade. Are we there yet? said Connor, stirring back to life. The cart rounded a corner into a very long and wide street. At the end of the street was an enormous palace. I'll take that as a yes, Connor said. The palace took Alex's breath away. It was perfectly symmetrical and smooth, as if it were made out of sky-gray porcelain. Three prominent towers in the middle of the palace shared a base with a gigantic clock large enough for the whole kingdom to see. The palace almost seemed fake. It was so majestic and was grander than anything she had ever imagined. This is where I'll drop you off, said Smithers, pulling his cart and horse over to the side of the street. Best of luck to both of you young'uns. Enjoy the town. Thank you so much, the twins said together. They tried to offer him a few gold coins as a thank you, but Smithers insisted that they save their money and then went on his way. The twins walked around the town for a good while. Everyone seemed to be buzzing with anticipation for the ball later that evening. They found a small market and were able to purchase some fresh fruit, vegetables, and bread. Alex kept trying to make small talk with every person she encountered, but most of the townspeople just ignored her. Connor kept rolling his eyes at his sister. Everything she saw excited her. I don't know how I'm going to survive traveling with you if you keep up this constant state of excitement, Connor said. It's exhausting, and it's really getting on my nerves. I'm sorry, Alex said. I've been around so many trees the last couple of days. I'm so excited to see all the people and their... Oh, look at that doorknob on that building. It's in the shape of a slipper. Isn't that cute? After a busy afternoon of sightseeing, they found a quiet hill that overlooked the town, and they sat under the shade of a large tree. The sun was starting to descend, and the twins grew anxious at the thought of another day ending. What's your plan? Connor asked. Let's see what the journal suggests. Alex said, and pulled it out from her school bag. She flipped through the pages until she came across the section about the glass slipper. Cinderella's glass slipper is very, a very difficult item to retrieve. Her slippers, without doubt, are the most cherished possession in the kingdom. First, you must find a way into the palace. That is rather difficult, as there is only one entrance. One of Cinderella's first acts as queen was to get rid of all the servants' entrances so that when people come to the palace, they all enter as equals. Once inside, find a way into Cinderella's royal display room. This also will be difficult since no one is allowed in the queen's chambers without an invitation from her. The slippers are on display in a glass box on the top of a pillar in the center of the room. The slippers are not hard to remove from inside the glass box, but the room is under constant watch by two guards at its entrance. Find a way to be alone in the royal display room and remove a slipper quietly and quickly. Leave as fast as you can because as soon as they notice something is missing, the guards will close the palace doors and you'll be trapped and taken to the dungeon to be hung upside down from your toenails. Best of luck. How are we going to get into the palace? Connor asked. 
Alex began to think of a plan, but she was distracted by a long line of carriages driving down the main street of the town toward the palace. They were elegant and colorful, and each was of its own design. Each carriage had at least two horses pulling it, a coachman, a footman riding on the back, and a number of passengers inside. The ball, Alex said. We'll have to sneak into the ball. Uh-huh, said Connor, contemplating this information. And what are we supposed to wear? Look at us. We're not dressed formally enough, and I bet we smell really fresh after walking for three days straight with no showers. I have an idea, Alex said. She opened their bags and took out their blankets. She grabbed hold of Connor and began wrapping the blanket around him, folding it strategically in certain places so it would stay up. Alex wrapped herself in the other blanket. There, said Alex. Now we look like we're wearing sensible robes. We look ridiculous, Connor said. Do you have any other ideas? Alex asked him. Do you think there's a fairy godmother hotline we could call? Connor asked. The twins walked down the main street. They folded the traffic, followed the traffic of carriages toward the palace. The closer they came to the palace, the larger it grew and the more real it became. Many of the coachmen glared at the twins with bewilderment and judgmental looks. A few passengers leaned out of their carriage windows to see what the twins were doing. Take a picture, it lasts longer, Connor shouted at them. Connor, they don't know what that means, Alex said. They reached the palace just as the sun was setting. As each carriage neared the front steps of the palace's entrance, its footmen would run around the carriage and gently help the passengers out. Alex and Connor had never seen such beautiful clothing. All the women wore long ball gowns of various colors, fabrics and stitching. They wore gloves and diamonds. Some were bows and feathers in their hair. The men all dressed beautifully too, some in formal armor, some in suits with broad fringed shoulders and square cuffs. All the effort and flair that the guests had put into their appearance made the twins feel very insecure about their impromptu robes. They stuck out like sore thumbs. They were the poorest people there. They were the only ones not dressed in la lace or satin, and they were the only ones carrying bags. They looked exactly like what they were, a couple of kids sneaking into a ball. An extensive row of steps led up to the palace's entrance. Alex and Connor began climbing them with the rest of the attendees. It was such a climb. They wondered if they would ever reach the top of it. This world is goblins and fairies, but there's an escalator. Where's an escalator when you need one, Connor said. Connor, Alex gasped, look at this. She pointed to a silver star placed in the steps underneath the feet. Their feet, it read. This marks the very place where Cinderella left her glass slipper behind on the night she met Prince Charming. Can you believe that's the very spot Cinderella left her glass slipper? Alex said with both hands pressed against her heart. Absolutely, Connor said. I wouldn't have climbed these steps again if I had left my shoe either. The twins caused quite a scene at the entrance. Everyone was absolutely appalled by their clothing. Alex could feel herself blushing from the way everyone was staring at her. She felt like she was back at school. One palace guard in particular couldn't stop staring at them, not in a judgmental way, but as, it, as if he'd seen them somewhere and couldn't remember where. He was standing just a, a step aside the pal inside the palace entrance, and he greeted all the guests that passed him. He wore more badges on his uniforms than any of the other guards, and he had a very thin, dark beard. Another palace guard was collecting invitations at the doors. The twins began to panic. What are we going to do? Alex whispered to her brother. Let me handle this, Alex said. I saw this in a movie once. Just go with it. Invitations, please, the guard said. Our parents have our invitations, but they're already inside, Connor said. And who are your parents? asked the guard snootily. Who are, our who are our parents, yelled Connor, causing a bigger scene than they hadn't already. You mean, you don't know who we are? All the guards and guests looked among one another. Connor, calm down, Alex said. Well, what was he thinking? This man doesn't know who our parents are, Alex, Connor continued. I'll have you know that our parents invented wishing, wishing wells. 
How dare you show us any disrespect? Alex wanted to slap them. She looked apologetically at the people around them. They all scowled in the twins' direction, except for the guard with the thin beard. He was actually smirking at them with gentleness in his eyes. I'm afraid you two have to leave now, said the guard, collecting the invitations. Leave? You are making the heirs of the wishing well fortune leave? Alex exclaimed loudly enough for everyone to hear. Connor, just shut up, Alex whispered directly into his ear. Is there a problem? The guard with the thin beard asked as he approached the twins. Not at all, Alex said and began backing up, forcing Connor to move with her. They don't have an invitation, the other guard said. We were just leaving, Alex said. Sorry for the confusion. Nonsense, the guard with a thin beard said. I just saw your parents inside the palace. Why don't I take you to them? Alex and Connor froze. You did, Alex said. Connor said, and they quickly remembered that he had to keep an uh, keep up with his own lie. I mean, of course you did. He threw a dirty look to the other guard. Come with me, and I'll take you straight to your parents, the guard with the thin beard said. Before they knew it, Alex and Connor were being escorted into the palace. They were completely in over their heads. Did this guard know they were lying, or was he now escorting them directly to the dungeon? Or perhaps Connor's lie was truer than he thought, and they were about to meet a couple that were definitely not their parents. Allow me to introduce myself, the guard said. I'm Sir Lambton, the head of the Queen's Royal Guard. Welcome to the palace. Thank you, Connor said. I'm Connor Wishington, and this is my sister, Alex. Where are you from, Mr. and Mrs. Wishington? Mr. and Ms. Wishington, Lambton asked. Upstate Northern Kingdom, Connor said. Even he looked surprised by the words coming out of his mouth. But our parents have a summer home in the south of the Sleeping Kingdom and a condo in the Fairy Kingdom. Alex's eyes opened so wide that she had to remind herself to blink. Ah, I see, Lambton said with a curious look. Would you like me to take your bags for you? No, that's quite all right, Alex said. We'll manage. Lambton led the twins down a long hallway behind all the other guests. There were many large portraits of past rulers on the walls, and a red carpet ran under their feet. Alex and Connor were all eyes. They had never seen inside a royal palace before. There were so many shiny things to look at. Lambton seemed to be enjoying their excitement. He leaned between them and softly said, You are sneaking into the palace, aren't you? Alex desperately looked to Connor, but he was out of, li out of lies for the night. Please don't throw us out of in the dungeon, Alex pleaded. We didn't mean any harm. Connor looked at his sister and raised an eyebrow. Did she mean no harm besides breaking into the palace and stealing a cherished item? Lambton chuckled. I've seen a lot of youngsters try to sneak into a royal ball before, but never have I see been so entertained by such an attempt, he said. So you aren't going to throw us in a cell and hang us upside down by our toenails? Connor asked. We stopped doing that years ago. Lambton said. On the contrary, it would be my honor to show you two around. Really? Connor said. That would be lovely, Alex said, clasping her hands together. Thank you. At the end of the hall, Lambton led the twins through a pair of golden doors in the ballroom. At first, the sight was overwhelming. There were so many things to look at, it was impossible to focus on any one thing long enough to comprehend what it was. There was so much movement and color. The biggest chandelier they had ever seen, with thousands of candles, hung from the ceiling above an enormous dance floor. Hundreds of formally dressed men and women filled the space. Some mingled on the sides, while others danced to the music played by the small orchestra in the corner. Everything from the archways to the accents on the walls was golden. A grand staircase descended in the back of the room, just between behind two empty thrones. Connor knew it would only be seconds before Alex started crying. It's so beautiful, Alex said with teary eyes. Is this where they had the ball where Cinderella and the prince met? Indeed, Lambton said. I'll never forget it. I was just a simple guard back then. The prince was meeting all the young women in the kingdom in hopes of finding a bride. Cinderella was the last to arrive that night. 
She entered the room just as we are now, and everyone stopped to look at her. How did she look? Alex asked. Magical, Lambton said with a smile, lost in his own memory. She wore a long violet dress that sparkled as she walked. I remember hearing the soft taps of her glass slippers as she walked past. As soon as the prince saw her, it was love at first sight. The whole palace could feel it. Suddenly, a man blew a trumpet at the front of the staircase. Ladies and gentlemen, the man with the trumpet announced, it is with great honor that I welcome you to the royal ball this evening. Now please give a warm welcome to the royal majesties, King Charming and Queen Cinderella. The guests cheered and burst into applause. The royal couple entered the ballroom, slowly making their way down the grand staircase. Alex grabbed onto Connor's arm. Connor, Alex gasped. It's Cinderella, it's Cinderella. Although the twins had only seen illustrations of her, Cinderella was more beautiful than they had ever expected. Her hair was auburn and styled up behind a crystal tiara. She wore white gloves and a long turquoise gown flowed down around her, accentuating her pregnant belly. Despite all the gold and glorious chandelier, her eyes and smile were the brightest things in the room. King Charming was the definition of dashing. He was every bit as handsome as any description ever written about him. He had a mesmerizing smile and thick wavy hair under a large golden crown. He could easily have been a movie star back in the twins' world. The king and queen took their seats on the thrones, and the guard with the trumpet blew the opening notes of another announcement. Let the ball begin, the guard with the trumpet proclaimed, and was greeted with another round of excited applause. The majority of the guests guests rushed to the dance floor. The orchestra began playing a fast-paced symphony. All the guests paired up and began waltzing around the room, each looking lovingly into their partner's eyes the entire time. The king and queen remained seated. They could tell Cinderella wanted to join the dance, but her pregnancy was pre preventing her from doing so. King Charming only had eyes for his wife. He was enjoying her watching the dance more than the actual dance itself. At one point, each of the dancing men collected a shoe from their partners and circled them with it before placing it back on their feet. A Cinderellian tribute, no doubt. Time flew by as the twins watched the ball. The unborn child Cinderella was carrying must have been kicking from all the excitement. Cinderella appeared to have some discomfort and had been rubbing her belly <clears throat> and shifting in her seat for some time. She eventually whispered something to King Charming into King Charming's ear. King Charming took his wife's hand and carefully helped her back up the grand staircase. <clears throat> the guard blew his trumpet again. The queen is tired and wishes to rest, but she and the king welcome you to continue this celebration without their presence. The crowd happily obliged and continued their fun. Would you like a tour of the palace? Lambton asked the twins. More than anything. Alex said. Lampton escorted the twins out of the ballroom and down a hall similar to the one they had first entered the palace through. It, too, was home to several portraits of past rulers and a long red carpet. This palace was built over 500 years ago, Lampton told them as he walked. It's been home to the Charming Dynasty since then. This is a portrait of King Chester Charming, Cinderella's late father-in-law. He referred to a large painting of an old bearded man with a crown. He looked exactly like his son, but much older. How many King Charmings have there been? Connor asked. We've lost count, Lambton said. There are three currently. King Chester had four sons, Chance Charming, Chase Charming, Chandler Charming, and Charlie Charming. Each of the Charming brothers had his own portrait on the wall. King Chance Charming is the oldest and is married to Queen Cinderella, Lambton said, and gestured to the portrait of the man they had just seen in the ballroom. King Chase Charming is the second oldest and is married to Queen Sleeping Beauty, Lambton continued. Chase looked exactly like his brother, except he was a bit taller and wore a goatee. King Chandler Charming is the third oldest and married to Queen Snow White, Lambton said. 
Chandler looked like his brothers, but had the longest hair of all of them. The last portrait in the hallway caught the twins' eye the most. It was hung slightly away from the rest and depicted the youngest of the charming brothers. He was young and had a big smile. A single candle was lit behind the portrait. It appeared to be a memorial of sorts. Who is that? Connor asked Lambton. Lambton's happy expression faded away. That's Prince Charlie, the fourth son of King Chester. He's the long-lost charming prince, Lambton said. He vanished one night many years ago, and we never saw him again. That's horrible, Alex said. His brothers led massive search parties throughout all the kingdoms, but they never found a trace of him, Lambton said sadly. Fortunately, some good came out of the search. While on the road, Prince Chandler came across Snow White in her glass coffin, and Prince Chase discovered Sleeping Beauty asleep in her castle, and they both broke the spells put on them and were married. That's incredible, Alex said. So if Prince Charlie never went missing, Sleeping Beauty and Snow White would still be unconscious. That may be, Lambton said. And since his brothers took all the eligible princesses, Prince Chance had to put on the ball where he and Cinderella met. Everything happens for a reason, I suppose. Alex and Connor couldn't stop staring at the portrait of Prince Charlie. There was a sad energy in the part of the hallway, and the twins were especially sensitive to it. The long-lost prince couldn't have been much older than them when he'd gone missing. Lambton clearly appreciated the twins' interest. Now follow me. I have something very special I want to show you, Lambton said. Lambton led the twins down another hallway that led deeper into the palace. This part of the palace was completely vacant, and it made the twins more and more nervous as they walked. They had no idea where Lambton was taking them, and they were too timid to ask. They rounded a corner, and at the end of another long hall was a pair of black double doors. There were two guards on either side of the doors and a large stone arch above them with a sign that read, Queen Cinderella's Royal Room of Display. Alex and Connor looked at each other with light in their eyes. They had made it. Hello, Sir Lambton, one of the guards said. Good evening, Lambton said. He pushed open the doors and the twins followed him inside. They set their bags down and looked around the room. The display room was a wide chamber with white pillars and blue, sky blue tiled floor. The ceiling was domed and covered in golden stars. The room was illuminated by moonlight coming from a large window in the back and then reflected throughout a series of hanging mirrors. Several special objects were on display and placed on the top of short pillars surrounded by thick glass cases. Brooms, buckets, and old raggedy dresses were all put on show. A family of mice lived in a glass case in a miniature replica of the palace. In the very center of the room were Cinderella's glass slippers. They were beautiful and petite, made from pure crystal glass and decorated with diamonds. The twins could feel their hearts sink into the pits of their stomachs as soon as they saw them. They were so close. Those are beautiful, Alex said. The slippers had put her in a trance. I'm quite partial to them myself, said a soft voice that didn't belong to Alex, Connor, or Lampton. Sitting on the windowsill in the back of the room was Cinderella herself. They had been so astonished by the display room they hadn't noticed her. Your Majesty, Lampton said, please forgive me, I didn't see you there. I was just giving some guests a tour of the palace. Quite all right, Sir Lampton, Cinderella said and walked across the chamber to greet them. I like to come in here occasionally after long days to clear my head. Who might these two be? Alex and Connor couldn't speak. They were completely starstruck. This is Alex and Connor, Lambton told her. Pleasure to meet you, Cinderella said and held out her hand. We're big fans, Connor said and shook her hand a little hot too hard. Alex couldn't move. You're like my hero, Alex said to her and that's all she could manage to say. Thank you, sweetheart, Cinderella said. Welcome to my little room of memories. It's remarkable, Alex squeaked. Would you like me to show you around, Cinderella asked. Alex still couldn't move her limbs, but was able to nod. Cinderella began a small tour and took them around the room to each of the displays on, 
items on display. These are the brooms and buckets I used to clean my stepmother's house every day, Cinderella said. They were my first dancing partners. I remember whenever I was home alone, I used to dance with them around the house and pretend I was in a big royal palace, although I must say they weren't the best at conversation. Cinderella and Lambton laughed. Alex and Connor were still in shock that they were in her presence. They were standing next to Cinderella, and she had a sense of humor. Over here are my raggedy old clothes that my fairy godmother turned into a beautiful ball gown, Cinderella continued. They're not much to look at now, but whenever my fairy godmother visits us, they turn back into the beautiful ball gown she created for me. That's really cool, Connor said. Uh, These are my mice, Cinderella said, and showed the twins the miniature palace full of mice. She opened a latch and took a mouse out of the case. She gently petted it, and it peacefully nestled in her hand. Are they the mice that were transformed into horses and coachmen for your carriage? Alex asked, finally finding her voice. The original mice passed away, but these are their children and their children's children, Cinderella said. I look after them as a thank you. They have a horrible reputation, but mice are actually very gentle creatures. You just have to give them a chance. Cinderella put the mouse back in the, with the others and walked to the center of the room. And these, I believe, need no explanation, she said, and brought the twins to the glass slippers. She removed the glass case entirely and took one of the glass slippers in her hand. These couldn't have been comfortable, Connor said. They were surprisingly easy to move about in, Cinderella said. Did your feet ever get sweaty? Connor went on. That couldn't have looked really... Ah, Alex elbowed him in the ribs. Cinderella snickered. Would you like me, would you like to hold one? Cinderella asked them. Alex nodded harder than she had ever nodded before. Cinderella gently lifted one from the pillar and handed it to her. A magical feeling went through Alex. She was holding a piece of fairy tale history. Perhaps the most famous object of all fantasy time was in her hands. She couldn't help but get a bit emotional. Connor, on the other hand, kept thinking of ways to steal the slipper. Alex looked up at her brother and knew what he was thinking by the intensity in his eyes. For a moment, they shared the same thought. Was it possible to just take off with it? Connor was actually thinking if it was possible to outrun Lampton and the two guards outside the door. What was it like? Alex asked Cinderella. What was it like to go from being a servant to being queen? What was it like to be saved from a horrible situation? Your life is literally, well, a Cinderella story. A sadness came to Cinderella's face. I never thought my life would change so drastically, so I always made the most of what I had, Cinderella said. I always laugh at the term Cinderella story, because if you ask me, it doesn't matter what life you're living, life never has a solution. No matter how hard the struggles are that you leave behind, New struggles always take their place. People forget that I wasn't liked very much by the people of the Charming Kingdom when I first came to live at the palace, Cinderella said. Not too many people were thrilled with the idea of a servant girl becoming their queen. Many people called me the Pumpkin Princess or the Mouse Monarch when they first discovered the details of how I came to the ball that night. I had to earn the kingdom's respect, and it wasn't easy. Being a queen has to have some perks, though, right? Connor asked. No more scrubbing floors or dancing with cleaning supplies or talking with mice? Meeting the man of my dreams and starting a family is the best thing that will ever happen to me, Cinderella said with a smile and rubbed her belly. And this is what makes me the happiest and luckiest woman in the world. However, living a public public life is a difficult thing to do. And even now, I still find it a bit overwhelming. No matter what you do, you never please everyone. And that was the hardest lesson to learn. In fact, I'm still learning it. This was all such a revelation to Alex. Suddenly the fairy tale world seemed even more real than it had before. She never thought she could respect Cinderella more than she already did. But she had never thought about the story from her point of view. Alex set the glass slipper back beside the other one. At first, Connor shot her a look. What are you doing? We have to steal that. 
but they both knew they couldn't take it, at least not tonight, not after the kindness they had been shown. After all the magical things that have happened in my life, this is the most prized possession, Cinderella said, her hands still on her pregnant stomach, and she's going to be here any day now. How do you know it's a girl? Alex asked. Mother's intuition, Cinderella said. She never sits still when she hears music, so she must have my taste and my father's energy. One of the guards from the hallway burst into the display room. Your Majesty, Sir Lampton, your presence has been requested in the ballroom. The guard had said very seriously, something was wrong. What's the matter? Sir Lampton asked. Soldiers from the Northern Kingdom, they've come with a message from the Queen and the King, he said. Lampton handed the twins their bags. Before they knew, th knew it, the twins were following him, Cinderella and the other guards out of the display room and down the hallway toward the ballroom. Now how are we going to get a hold of one of the glass slippers? Connor whispered to Alex. We'll have to collect all the other items first and then come back for it, Alex said. It should be easier to explain why we need it if we have the other items. We've already established a trusting relationship with them. I knew I should have grabbed one when I had the chance, Connor said. They re-entered the ballroom. All the guests were still, and the orchestra was dead silent. Cinderella reunited with her husband at the thrones. Dozens of the same soldiers dressed in silver armor, whom Alex and Connor had seen on the first day in the Land of Stories, were now spread throughout the ballroom. Forgive our intrusion, Your Majesty. My name is Sir Grant. I am the head of Queen Snow White's Royal Guard. We have news regarding the evil queen, the leader of the soldiers said. What is it? King Charming said. Everyone in the room could tell it was not good news by his tone. You could have cut the tension and worry in the air with a knife. Last night, a magic mirror that belonged to the evil queen was stolen from her former chambers, Sir Grant said. The evil queen is still very much at large, and that she has her former mirrors makes her a much greater threat to all of us. We are asking, pleading, if anyone in the Charming Kingdom knows anything about where the evil queen is hi hiding, that they please let us know immediately. Snow White's soldiers filed out of the ballroom. King Charming and Cinderella embraced each other, worried both for themselves and for what the news meant for their kingdom. It was lovely to meet you children, but I must go now, Lampton said to them. He patted their shoulders and then headed out after the soldiers. Many of the guests began leaving as well. Alex and Connor followed them out, down the entrance steps and away from the palace. This whole evil queen situation is starting to concern me, Alex said. I know, but it's not really our problem, Connor said. We'll be long gone before anything else happens. I suppose so, Alex said. Where are we off to now? Connor asked. The Little Red Riding Hood Kingdom is north of here, Alex said. I say that's the best direction to head. I hope we have better luck getting hold of Red Riding Hood's basket. We'd better not chicken out this time, Connor said. Gosh, we were so close, he clenched his fist tight. We just couldn't have taken it. Not without permission, Alex said. It wouldn't have felt right. I'm so tired of being a good person, Connor said. Despite having failed to collect a glass slipper and the abrupt end of their evening, the twins had had a pretty fantastic night. It wasn't every day that they got to have such an intimate conversation with one of the most famous women in history. Luckily, the twins found a night driver transporting a cart full of pears to a village in the northern part of the Charming Kingdom. They convinced him to let them ride in the back of his carriage in exchange for a few gold coins. It would only be a few miles walk to the Red Riding Hood kingdom from there. Connor fell asleep as soon as they climbed aboard. Alex couldn't sleep, she, so she decided to read through the journal again. She reached into her bag and was, ast was astounded to discover what was inside it. Connor! Alex gasped. Connor jumped back to consciousness. What is it? he asked. He looked over and saw something very shiny in his sister's hand. His eyes were still a little blurry from sleeping, and he had to let them adjust before realizing what it was. A glass slipper? Connor exclaimed, and Alex gestured for him to keep quiet so the driver wouldn't hear them. How in the world did we get one? Did you steal it? I thought it was you! Alex's mouth was so wide, it could have fit a dozen of pears inside it. 
No, it wasn't me. I swear. Do you think Lampton or Cinderella put it in our bag? Connor asked. Do you think one of them knew we needed it? I have no idea, Alex said. She couldn't believe she was actually holding on to one of Cinderella's glass slippers. They were both completely dumbfounded. Looks like our trip to the Charming Kingdom wasn't such a waste after all, Connor said. The end of that chapter. That was a long one. Thanks for hanging on with me. Next time.